what triggered this bizarre behavior. Journey into the cold heart of northern darkness with Nordic crimes. That case uh, became like a scene from a horror movie. A new true crime documentary series that chilled the bone. The hunger for killing is increasing in the course of these homicides. Listen on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Nordic Crimes is a part of the ACAST family. Hey, I'm Ryan Reynolds. Recently, I asked Mint Mobile's legal team if big wireless companies are allowed to raise prices due to inflation. They said yes. And then when I asked if raising prices technically violates those onerous two-year contracts, they said, what the f*** are you talking about, you insane Hollywood ass. So to recap, we're cutting the price of Mint Unlimited from $30 a month to just $15 a month. Give it a try at mintmobile.com slash switch. $45 up front for three months plus taxes and fees. Promote for new customers for limited time. Unlimited more than 40 gigabytes per month. Slows full terms at mintmobile.com. And welcome to mini episode 330 of Real Life Ghost Stories. And I have three spooky stories for you today. And the last story comes from the 9th of December 1989. And story number one comes from James. I am a retired US Marine. And I've been a police officer for almost 18 years. I'm man enough to admit that sometimes things scare me. I'm not, nor have I ever been one to call something paranormal if I couldn't explain it. For example... We were dispatched for a report of a male trespassing in an open-air warehouse. The warehouse had no walls, just a roof with supports. The warehouse contained heavy canvas bags filled with fine sand. The floor had about two to three inches of this sand on the ground. The security guard who had called us said that he saw a male walking around. The guard showed us the footprints in the sand. We followed them until they came to a stop. There was no place for this person to go and I could never explain it. Weird? Yes. Paranormal? I can't say. Fast forward six years. My partner and I were dispatched for someone going into an abandoned house. This was nothing uncommon. Normally it's kids being kids, addicts looking for privacy to use, or drug dealers using the building as a stash house. We made entry and cleared the first floor. My partner went upstairs and I went into the basement. With basement steps, it is important to get down and off the steps as quickly as possible. If someone is under the steps and grabs your ankles while you're coming down the steps, you're screwed. I got into the basement and away from the steps. From left to right, I swung my flashlight from under the steps and over the steps. When my light was over the steps, I saw a little girl, maybe 10 to 12 years old, straight dark hair to the middle of her back. She was wearing a white nightgown that had a light floral pattern on it. She was sitting slightly bent over, her elbows tucked into her waist, and her hands were covering her face as if she was crying. My momentum from left to right passed her. I only saw her for a split second. When I went back right to left, she was gone. But it gets worse. Those steps were my only exit out of the basement. I no longer cared about who might be in the house, I just wanted out. When I began going back up the steps two at a time, I passed the step I had seen the little girl. The temperature dropped. When I got outside, I could not stop shivering. Despite being 80 degrees outside, I couldn't shake the thought of walking through the ghost of a small child. James, that is like something straight out of a horror film. Like I could could see it happening in my brain, including your continued sweep. And then she's gone. Oh my God. That is horrendous. And to go back to your um, the, the beginning of your story, I can understand what you mean about not wanting to say that everything is paranormal. Like weird things definitely do happen. But if you're a police officer and you're searching for somebody and you can't find them, you know, you can't just say, well, it's probably paranormal. You obviously have to try and figure out any logical explanation as to where that person had gone to. So I totally understand the reluctance to say things are paranormal willy nilly. 
I mean, the story with the footprints in the sand is uh, is pretty weird. And it's a good example. But it is still pretty weird. But as for the little girl sitting on the steps, like, I just don't... I just don't know what I would do. Like, I mean, like you said, you're already on high alert, right? Because you're doing this search. You're walking down the basement steps. You're conscious of somebody reaching out and grabbing your feet from under from under the steps in the basement. And then you see this little girl and you obviously saw enough of her to get to get all of that description of her. I I think I would have gone outside and puked, to be honest. And it's really interesting that you saw her for that split second and then you didn't see her again. But you felt her when you were walking up the stairs. So she hadn't gone anywhere. You just couldn't see her for that moment in time. And I wonder if it's something to do with um, this is going to sound like a really strange example, but your brain can do some pretty wonderful things. And that includes blocking out information that it thinks is going to be overwhelming or that we don't need. So, for example, you can actually see your nose all the time, but your brain blocks it out, which I think is crazy. And sometimes I wonder if something similar happens with ghosts or spirits or whatever. Like for that tiny split second, was did your brain like lower its guard and let you see something that maybe you shouldn't have seen? If you're looking for plump lips that last, you need to know about Juvederm Lip Fillers. With Juvederm Volbella XC and Juvederm Ultra XC, your lip look, whether it's subtle or bold, can last up to one full year with optimal treatment and no additional maintenance. Find a licensed specialist and see if it's right for you at Juvederm.com today. That's J-U-V-E-D-E-R-M.com. Add fullness to lips in adults over 21 with Juvederm Volbella XC or Juvederm Ultra XC. Do not use if you have severe allergies or a history of severe allergic reactions, or if you're allergic to lidocaine or the proteins used in Juvederm. Tell your doctor if you have a history of scarring or taking medicines that decrease the body's immune response or that can prolong bleeding. Common side effects include injection site redness, swelling, pain, tenderness, firmness, lumps, bumps, bruising, discoloration, or itching. As with all fillers, there's a rare risk of unintentional injection into a blood vessel, which can cause vision abnormalities, blindness, stroke, temporary scabs, or scarring. For full, important safety information, visit Juvederm.com. Millions of people have lost weight with personalized plans from Noom. Like Evan, who can't stand salads and still lost 50 pounds. Salads generally for most people are the easy button, right? For me, that wasn't an option. I never really was a salad guy. That's just not who I am. But Noom worked for me. Get your personalized plan today at Noom.com. Real Noom user compensated to provide their story. In four weeks, the typical new user can expect to lose one to two pounds per week. Individual results may vary. And story number two comes from Sophie. I have a really creepy story about something that happened to me several years ago in a small church in a quaint Derbyshire village. I haven't recounted my story for a long time, mostly because I fear people won't believe me. But after listening to your podcast, I feel compelled to share it with you and your listeners. To set the scene, the church in question is a beautiful building in stunning grounds right next to the River Derwent. Like most churches, it's very old. The original church was built back in the 12th century by the Normans, and is even mentioned earlier than this in the Doomsday Book published in 1086. My story starts at Christmas time, maybe 14 or 15 years ago now, when I went along to watch a Christmas concert in which one of my friends had a small reading to do. I was around 15 years old at the time. It was around 7.30pm and, typical of me, I was running late. It was dark and bitterly cold outside, being midwinter, and I was alone, rushing past the cemetery to get inside. I pushed through the large oak church doors to try and sneak in unseen, but several heads turned to look at me as it creaked and echoed open. Embarrassed, I mouthed a typical British, So sorry! and raised an apologetic hand for the disturbance. The room was abundant with beautiful Christmas decor, warm candlelight, and the dulcet tones of the church priest. I'm not religious or much of a believer in anything spiritual, but the atmosphere felt homely and weirdly comforting. I quickly scanned around to find an empty seat, but the place was full, aside from one single empty pew right at the back of the room, not far from the church entrance. Being quite the introverted individual, I thought, great, no neighbours. I sat down and picked up the concert programme, to my relief, finding that I hadn't yet missed my friend's reading. 
Ten minutes passed and I sat patiently waiting for my friend to stand up and perform. Naturally, the church was quite chilly, so I hadn't taken off my coat or my scarf, when I immediately felt a rush of icy cold air down the back of my neck. Oddly, I was suddenly very uncomfortable, and I felt that awful, inexplicable feeling that somebody was watching me. I shrugged it off. It's an old building, likely drafty, and it's mid-December. What do you expect, right? Until it happened again a few seconds later, and much more forceful this time. I immediately spun around, thinking another late arrival like myself must have opened the doors for there to be such an icy cold breeze. To my surprise, there was no one. No one, that is, apart from a figure standing directly behind me, not six feet away. I was taken aback by his sudden appearance and I sat trying to compute where he had come from. The door hadn't opened. There had been no sound to suggest anybody had moved behind me, and he certainly wasn't stood there a few minutes ago. He was standing with his back against the church wall, facing forwards, watching intently and eerily still. He was wearing a long black robe with large sleeves and a hood that completely shadowed any view of his face. His hands and arms were neatly placed inside the opposing long draping sleeves and resting across his torso. He looked like every textbook depiction of a medieval monk. I recall thinking, what on earth has this man come in fancy dress to a Christmas concert for? Nobody else I could see was wearing similar attire. Was he part of the concert or had I totally missed the memo? I sat there studying him fiercely, trying desperately to find any trace of facial features. The faint outline of a nose or a chin, the glint of an eye. Nothing. Everything seemed to fall silent and it was deafening. He never moved, never made a sound and continued to face forwards despite me scrutinising him for what felt like a lifetime. His presence felt very unsettling, the air was heavy and oppressive, and a feeling of dread bubbled up inside me. I spun back around to face the front for fear of coming across rude. Confused, my brain couldn't put the puzzle pieces together. What had I just seen? Why was he dressed like that, and why do I feel so uneasy? Within seconds, I did a double take and turned again to confirm that none of this was a figment of my imagination, only to find that he had vanished. I frantically scanned the church, my eyes darting to every door and passageway, every seat, every nook and cranny of the room to find him, every entrance and exit was entirely visible to me. It was physically impossible for him to have made off so quickly and silently. Every hair in my body stood on end as I came to the realisation that I couldn't explain what had happened. I desperately wanted to leave, but anxiously sat through the rest of the concert, convinced it was much better to be in here with all these people than out there in the dark by myself. I never breathed a word to anybody about my experience until weeks later, and I can't say I've ever felt fear like it since. To this day I can't explain what or who it was that I saw that night, His clothing, his faceless figure, his eerily silent, ominous presence and his instantaneous disappearance made me feel like I witnessed something supernatural. Was he the ghost of a medieval monk simply enjoying the show? Or did the way he made me feel suggest something much more sinister? Safe to say, I haven't been back to the church since. Sophie, what a story. Oh my goodness. Everything about this story feels like a classic Christmas Eve sort of Victoriana ghost story, do you know? It's Christmas, it's dark, it's bitterly cold. You're late to this little quaint church and you're sort of sitting at the back being like, sorry, 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 sorry for making noise, sorry I'm late. And then you see the ghost of a monk in a robe. Like, I think the feeling that accompanied seeing the entity, whatever it was, I think is is very, very interesting. Because I totally, I think most people would think the same thing. You'd turn around and see him stand there and go, what's this knob doing here in fancy dress, you know? And I wonder if you get that sort of swooping feeling of unease and oh, something isn't right. Because your brain is sensing something that isn't necessarily human. And monks, you know, they dedicated their entire lives to the church and Christmas would have been an important time. 
of prayer and worship. So maybe maybe that time of year, maybe the amount of people in the church, maybe the songs, maybe the fact that it was Christmas, maybe that kind of allowed his energy to manifest in some way, or maybe it was like a, a, a rip in time and you got to see him, unfortunately. Oh, what a spooky little story. And our final story today comes from Amy. I have a couple of experience I encountered while working at the Fort Amherst in Chatham in Kent. This all happened around the ages of 17 and 18 and I'm now 33, so the memories have stuck around. My brother ran an educational centre at Fort Amherst specialising in World War II school trips and Napoleonic birthday parties for children where they got to dress up in red coats and march around with a wooden gun. Brilliant really. My mum also helped run the centre on a day-to-day basis and in doing so, I also got involved by helping on school trips and parties. I also helped with the ghost tours. My first experience was when my mum was showing me the tunnels and where all the light switches were, as I would help shut the tunnels down. I would have my hair pulled, cheeks pinched and be touched on a daily basis. This was a normal occurrence throughout the time that I helped. I also had all the lights turn off on me, leaving me in the middle of the tunnel system with no torch in the pitch black, so I had to turn all the lights back on and restart the shutdown process. I was then fortunate enough to have a sleepover in the tunnels with my friends, and during one of our conversations, we kept hearing talking behind us. And at one lull in our conversation, the talking behind continued, so as any person would, we thought someone had broken into the tunnels. So we gathered up some protection, empty beer bottles, and went on a hunt. We worked our way down to the main gate, checking all the nooks and crannies, but we didn't find anything. I was checking in the ARP bunk room and noticed that there was a new mannequin. A gentleman wearing a green checked deer hunter hat, like Sherlock Holmes, and a green checked cloak type thing with gold buttons. He had a moustache and was standing straight against the wall in between the two bunks. We didn't find any humans, so we went back to where we were bunking. In the morning, on my way out, I just so happened to be passing the ARP bunk room, and to my surprise, there was no new mannequin. In fact, there were no mannequins in that room at all. My mum's friend would participate in Napoleonic reenactments and would play the flute, traditional songs from that point in time. We were sitting in the office block and saw a gentleman pass through the main entrance. At first we thought it was my mum's friend until we realised that he was only visible from his knees up and was wearing an officer's uniform, which we didn't have anyone on site that day wearing that particular clothing. The strangest experience I had was when I was invited on a ghost walk as I was volunteering my time on the ghost tours, so it was a training session of sorts. On entering through the main gates, the man who was a medium stopped and said we needed to ask the guardian of the gates to allow us access. At that moment, I noted a huge misty figure, the size of the gates, if not bigger, blocking the access to the tunnels. The man I was with looked up and asked, please may we come in? The figure craned its neck down towards him and nodded and with that it dissipated. I've also heard the sounds of drums in certain areas and had boots follow me all the way out of the tunnel system. I had one woman so affected on a ghost tour that she was shaking so much from fear and I had to take her out of the tunnels on my own. Again, we were followed across a wooden floor with the sound of heavy boots. Overall, the experiences I had encountered were all very positive, if not mischievous. I've also included a picture taken on a digital camera. It has been enhanced by turning up the contrast, but you can see the face of a woman in the top corner and also a red coat standing against the wall. This was taken in the Sally Port, where it is reported that a woman and child died during a collapse and she patiently waits for her husband. So as per, I will post the images on Facebook, Instagram and on the Patreon feed also. Amy, I'm absolutely astounded that by the end of this you were like, you know, it was it was it was all positive contact, like mischievous. Doesn't sound very positive to me. If things are pulling my hair and pinching my cheeks and follow me around, and I'm here in boots and I'm things are turning lights off on me. I would be I would not be calling that mischievous. I'd be calling that very annoying and admittedly very scary. 
I'm not entirely sure why it freaked me out so much, but that story where you and your friend were hearing the voices, hearing the conversations and went to check and you you were like, oh, there's a new mannequin. And uh, then you realise in the morning there wasn't a new mannequin. that you, You'd obviously seen an apparition. And I, I have to say I would be reluctant to be going back into work after that. It sounds like you had a really like rich and varied and wild experience while you were working there. And I guess in a way, like I understand you saying now in hindsight, it's it's kind of positive and it, it felt mischievous. And, and I can only imagine that it would give you kind of a new a newfound respect or appreciation for the things that we can't see. Also, Fort Amherst is uh, still open if anybody wants to go and visit it. I was looking it up before I recorded this episode and it looks very, looks very cool, very dog friendly, which I think is important. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode. Thank you to James, Sophie and Amy for sending in your stories. Remember, the last story came from the 9th of December 1989. And if you would like to send in your story, you can do so by emailing it to reallifeghoststoriespodcast.gmail.com. You can also check out the website reallifeghoststoriespodcast.com. And if you are desperate for some extra content, you can subscribe to the Patreon. That is patreon.com forward slash reallifeghoststories, where for $5 a month or $2 a month, you get access to heaps of extra content, as well as every single main and mini episode completely ad-free. And on that note, I shall see you next time. 